In the book of Luke, chapter 4, Jesus announces his mission while in a synagogue on the Sabbath. Luke 4, 18 to 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So it's no surprise when he releases another captive, one who has tremendous faith, long after his initial declaration of his mission. Luke 13, 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things being done by him. The word of the Lord. Most of the time when we dig into this particular scripture, uh, the focus is on Jesus' relationship with the Jewish leader and the hypocrisy of the Sabbath law. Why can't Jesus heal on the Sabbath? Now, Jesus in the synagogue on the Sabbath does not disobey Jewish law. In fact, there is nothing in the Torah that specifically says that healing cannot be done on the Sabbath. There are over 40 things that cannot be done, but healing is not one of them. Jesus is not disobedient to the law or to God. Disobedience is not why he has come. Let's review again why he has come. To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus didn't heal the woman to give her liberation from an oppressive socio-religious system. No, he healed her because she was suffering. That's it suffering for 18 years. The woman who was healed more than likely was cared for by her Jewish community of the synagogue where Jesus sees her. Yet when Jesus calls her, she goes. She doesn't hesitate. She doesn't stop to ask the leaders of the synagogue what to do. She's been there many years and I'm sure she knows tradition and law. But when Jesus calls, she goes. Listen to Professor Janine Brown's interpretation. She had gotten used to looking up at people out of the corner of her eye by looking up and sideways. After 18 years, she could hardly remember any other way of seeing the world. On this particular Sabbath, there was a special excitement at the synagogue where she regularly went to worship. A Galilean preacher and prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, had arrived in town and would be teaching there. She and the others in town had heard reports about Jesus how he talked about God's reign arriving soon and how he healed the sick. She was not sure how many of the rumors to believe, but she was trying not to get her hopes up. Her life already had too many disappointments to count. When she entered the synagogue, the place was abuzz, and as Jesus began to teach, however, the room was hushed. Moments later, his words turned from teaching to invitation. He had caught her eye, no mean feat, given that he had to lean over and incline his head to do so. Come here, he said to her, and she slowly made her way to the front of the assembly. I wonder what she was thinking when he called her. As I said earlier, she didn't hesitate, not a bit, to go to him, and she was healed. What a risk she took. And exploring the story from Professor Jean Brown's perspective, based on this woman's perspective, 
highlights the way her healing expands the kingdom of God. Because after she's healed, she rejoices. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. And then when Jesus' discussion with the synagogue leaders comes to a close, the crowd does this. The entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. The praise the woman offers to God is amplified through the rejoicing of the crowds. The woman took a risk in coming over to Jesus and took a risk in rejoicing. She was standing in the synagogue that cared for her. But her faith, after hearing him speak, her faith became stronger than her desire for security and safety. She moved forward with utter dependence on this God. Why did Jesus come to earth again? To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This healing was fulfilling his mission the vision that God had cast for him. You know, Big Cove Presbyterian Church has a mission and a vision. Let's read them together. Together. Mission for Big Cove Presbyterian Church. You ready? Big Cove Presbyterian Church values being an intimate, welcoming, and caring family of faith who worships God with all its soul and shines his light into the world. That's who we are. That's our DNA, who we are. And then God has helped us cast a vision for the future as well. Vision for Big Cove Presbyterian Church, a vision. Big Cove Presbyterian Church is called to glorify God through vital worship, provide family to all, to meet people where they are on their faith journey, to be an intentional presence in the community, and shine the light of God to the world. Hmm. Speaks volumes about who we are. I'd like to read you a letter that I wrote to the session and the mission and outreach team last Wednesday night. Dear team members, last week in our session meeting, I introduced the book Sailboat Church by Joan S. Gray. The book compares rowboat churches to sailboat churches. Rowboat churches are the churches who know the agenda and focus on circumstances, such as the money it can raise, the available volunteers, the charisma and skill of the leaders, and the demographics of the community. The rowboat congregation believes and acts as if its progress depends on its own strength, wisdom, and resources. It's all about how hard, long, and well people are willing to row. In contrast, the bedrock of the sailboat church is that God, through the power at work within us, we can do abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Sailboat churches tend to focus not on their own situation, resources, or limitations, but rather on discerning God's unfolding will. They engage in intimate partnership with God to provide and do what only God can do. And these congregations live in creative tension between those spiritual realities in a rowboat church, as long as the church is able to keep rowing, people are often reluctant to do anything else. Rowing means that we are in control. We are getting the job done. And when they reach a point where they can't row anymore, or when rowing is not getting them where they need to go, then they're faced with a choice. Give up, sell up, close down, or get in fights that close you down. Sailboat churches know when God becomes the chief guide and power source in their lives and in their ministries as the unthinkable moves into the realm of possible. Sailboat congregations know they cannot make the wind blow, but they do realize they can tap into spiritual resources beyond themselves by reorienting their efforts and catching the wind of the Spirit. Luke 1, 35 to 37, with God nothing is impossible. Continuing the letter. A few weeks ago, we had a parishioner with young children approach our mission and outreach team to ask if we would consider hosting a summertime story time for children. The libraries are so full that the children cannot see the books being presented, and it's hot outside, and there are very few places, free places, for moms and dads to take the children. The mission and outreach team agreed that this would be outreach, so they said yes. However, 
Outreach does not usually involve the church building. Outreach is like it sounds outside the walls. However, seeing this need was for an air-conditioned <coughs> air free location, they agreed to give it a try and use our sanctuary as a safe place that was cool. Today, we hosted the first story time and we had eight children. Apparently, word is spreading and there will be more next week. One mom felt so comfortable, she asked if we could celebrate her child's birthday next week by singing to him. This endeavor felt like a risk, a leap of faith. However, we behaved like a sailboat church and asked God where the Spirit wanted us to be. There are many signs along the way during the process that indicated that God was in the plan for story time. We do not know what God has in mind with this simple reading program, but God often does amazing things with small endeavors that are centered in love for his children. Please pray for this spirit-driven program that was based on a direct need from the community. We heard their cries and responded, what a church, Big Cove Sales. End of letter. Friends, the woman at the synagogue trusted God to be at work in her life in a marvelous way. Jesus honored her faith by touching her and healing her. She had the faith and God had the power. Big Cove trusted God at work in a small, simple story time program for his children. We took the risk and started one. We must not only expect great things from God, but also attempt great things for God. So often in our churches and in our own lives, God is willing, but we can be reluctant. And faith requires us to make a bold response to the initiatives of God, the initiatives of God, and we're making a response to that because everything is possible with God. Friends, I have a question to ask you. What are the places where you think God is already at work and we can join God? And that could be personally or in a church family. Where is God already at work and we can join God? Wow. The care center. First stop, our mission partnerships. The Vine Counseling Center. Oh, God is all, all over that. So that's great. So our mission partners are a place we can join. Where else can we join God who's, where's God's already at work? Huddle House Church, sure. Huddle House Gang, yes, yes. And if anybody wants to be on that list to join us or join Ralph when he and Kevin goes, just let them know and they'll call you when they set up another Huddle House time. It's a fun time. Any other place? Hospitals. Hospitals. Yep. Interesting, I went to see Jimmy yesterday and I did have an encounter with a woman as I was leaving. And she was on a cane and she was struggling and she just looked so forlorn, and I said to her, hospital visits can be long, can't they? She said, oh, yes. And I took a risk, because I didn't want to invade her privacy, but I took a risk, and I said, is there someone that you love here in the hospital that's having a hard time? She said, oh, yes, my daughter, and it's just awful. She said, they're running all these tests, but they don't know what's wrong with her. I said, oh, that can be so difficult. <laughs> so difficult and she looked at my name tag and she knew that I was a pastor and I just said I'll be keeping you in my prayers and my heart this week I know this is going to be difficult for your family I'm so sorry God was already there God was already there in that encounter I just had to be aware that it was there right so sometimes it's the church that gathers and does this and we approach situations like this story time but sometimes it's us individually, where we are, keeping our eyes and ears open for where the spirit is already at work, and we're just joining that spirit. We're just joining it. You know? I'm sure you encounter that all the time with karaoke. You know, the spirit's there, right? But you're just joining the spirit, and sometimes you'll have situations where you know you need to say something, and sometimes you know when to hold back, right? Absolutely. It's like being in awake. It's like being in awake. Yeah, the Lord puts the right words in your head at awake absolutely to say, because sometimes we don't know what to say, particularly if a child has died. You know, like, what do you say, right? 
but God will help us. So be thinking about this. And I mean, God already is at work there. God already is completely at work. So I guess I have to think about the bigger question. Do we have the faith, like the woman in the synagogue, like the woman in the synagogue, to be able to let God take our very lives and join God in that work, celebrating and praising God, even when the circumstances might not be ideal? Do we have that kind of faith? If not, if we don't feel like we do, then what do we need to do? Be in community to be able to give our faith some strength, to be in community. And that will really, really help us. It really will. Let's pray together, friends. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time together today to explore your word. And we know that our faith is sometimes not as strong as you'd like it to be. <laughs> we also know that we often pick up the oars instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to take our sails to propel us where you want us to be and to go. Take our very lives, Lord, and let them be consecrated just for you and guide us into a life filled with endless praise for you as well. Amen.